just when Good Church. We are passionate about seeing people live in the freedom and purpose that Jesus has for our lives. This week is a life group week. We encourage everyone to be part of a group for deeper connection, accountability and support. If you want to join a group, head to the Start Here desk after the service. We encourage you to join us on Uversion to explore our church-wide plan. This week's plan is entitled I Am N a devotion from the Voice of the Martyrs sharing stories of Christians who have been persecuted for their faith in Jesus. Scan the QR code now and connect with us on Uversion. If you're new to our church community, we want to find out more about you. Come along to First Steps next Sunday, the 17th of September. This is an opportunity to hear more about LifeGate Church and share some of your story with us. You can sign up for First Steps at the Start Here desk after the service. Next Sunday, we're also holding Baptism Sunday. If you are yet to be baptised and would like to, go to the Start Here desk to find out more. If you missed it last week, The Bloke's Escape is back. From the 19th to the 21st of January 2024 at Bonnyvale Camping Ground in the Royal National Park. Men, put the date in your diaries. You are welcome to bring your kids too. 
it will be a great weekend. Thank you for your financial giving. Your giving enables us to present the message of Jesus to our church and community. You can give by cash, direct deposit or tithely. For more information, head to the Start Here desk or the LifeGate website. Finally, thank you for joining us at LifeGate Church today. Please help us stay connected by scanning the QR code to let us know that you're here. It's good to see everyone here this morning. I always love that time where we get to go around talking to people. I'd prefer it if it was like 20 minutes though, but that's all right. We'll do that afterwards. Come chat to me afterwards. I love meeting, I love meeting you guys. Ah, oh, I see De Montfort kids here. Hey, Dev, hey, Phil. I haven't seen you guys a long time. And I think I saw Matt somewhere too. Hello, Matt, if you're in the room. Or you were in the room. Yeah. Well, that's a nice surprise. <laughs> I hope everyone's having a, a happy Father's Day so far, um, or as, as Hannah shared in the 9 a.m. service, for some of us it's not, uh, Father's Day, hey Matt, Father's Day might not be a, um, a happy time, maybe your father was not what he could have been, but the good thing is, God is perfect and God is always with you and God is always there for you, and he, he can bridge any gap that was left by, by our parents or loved ones. So, yeah, well, and, and he's who we're going to focus on today. But, you know, in today's society, we're told to make things about ourselves. Go find a job that makes you happy. Find a partner that makes you feel good about yourself. There's a company's slogan, uh, slogan that says, because you're worth it. We're told, go do whatever makes you feel nice. Or some people even say, go find yourself. I still don't know what that means, because I'm right here. Why do I need to find myself? Making things all about ourselves, that's the whole idea behind consumerism and a lot of advertising and marketing. You know, make people... Focus on the need to become more stylish or become more attractive or somehow become better. And, you know, they'll say, if you keep buying our products, you'll become more desirable and you'll earn the approval of others. Has anyone else noticed this? Yeah. But today, today we're going to look at why we should not make things about ourselves. Don't make it about you. We're looking at 2 Kings chapter 5. Now Naaman was commander of the army of the king of Aram. He was a great man in the sight of his master and highly regarded, because through him the Lord had given victory to Aram. He was a valiant soldier, but he had leprosy. When the Bible mentions leprosy, it could be referring to any of the various diseases at that time that affected the skin. Now, anyone with leprosy was looked upon with shame and disgust and maybe even fear because many forms of leprosy were contagious and some forms of leprosy even led to a slow and painful death. There was a law at the time where anyone with leprosy had to live away from the community in an area with all the other lepers in order to not spread the disease. There was also a law that said, a leper could not come within two meters of a clean person so that they wouldn't get sick as well. And I even read there may have been a law that said that anyone with leprosy could not come within 45 meters of a clean person when the wind was blowing because the wind might blow the germs a greater distance. I don't know if people went and carried their measuring tape around with them. Leprosy, Naaman would have suffered the same shame and disgust because of his leprosy. Now, bands of, bands of raiders from Aram had gone out and had taken a captive a young girl from Israel, and she served Naaman's wife. She said to her mistress, If only my master would see the prophet who is in Samaria, he would cure him of his leprosy. At this time, Samaria was the capital city of Israel, and Elisha, a prophet, 
was living there. Now, in biblical times, God spoke to the nation of Israel through several people, and these people were called prophets. And God also did many miracles through some of these prophets. Naaman went to his master and told him what the girl from Israel had said. By all means, go, the king of Aram replied. I will send a letter to the king of Israel. So Naaman left, taking with him 10 talents of silver, 6,000 shekels of gold, and 10 sets of clothing. That's 340 kilos of silver and 69 kilos of gold. It's a lot of cash. The letter that he took to the king of Israel read, With this letter I am sending my servant Naaman to you so that you may cure him of his leprosy. As soon as the king of Israel read the letter, he tore his robes and said, Am I God? Can I kill and bring back to life? Why does this fellow send someone to me to be cured of his leprosy? See how he is trying to pick a quarrel with me. When Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his robes, he sent him this message. Why have you torn your robes? Have the man come to me, and he will know that there is a prophet in Israel. So Naaman went with his horses and chariots and stopped at the door of Elisha's house. Elisha sent a messenger to say to him, Go wash yourself seven times in the Jordan, and your flesh will be restored, and you will be cleansed. But Naaman went away angry and said, I thought he would surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God, wave his hand over the spot, and cure me of my leprosy. Are not Abana and Farpa, the rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel? Couldn't I wash in them and be cleansed? So he turned and went off in a rage. Can anyone relate to this? Asking God for something, but then when he answers you in a way that you didn't expect, you complain, saying, I thought you would have answered my prayer in the way that I expected you to. I asked you for money, but instead you're giving me job opportunities, so I have to work for my money? I didn't ask for this. I asked you for patience, and I thought you would just go, poof, patience for Alex. But instead, I'm now stuck behind the slowest drivers known to mankind. <laughs> that lady was really rude to me at the checkout. My partner is yelling at me. My dog just peed on my bed. <laughs> and so God, instead of you just going, patience, it looks like you're giving me opportunities to choose to be patient. I didn't ask for this. Naaman's servants went to him and said, My father, if the prophet had told you to do some great thing, would you not have done it? How much more then when he tells you, wash and be cleansed? So he went down and dipped himself in the Jordan seven times, as the man of God had told him, and his flesh was restored and became clean like that of a young boy. Then Naaman and all his attendants went back to the man of God. He stood before him and said, now I know that there is no God in all the world except in Israel. So please accept a gift from your servant. The prophet answered, As surely as the Lord lives whom I serve, I will not accept a thing. And even though Naaman urged him, he refused. We're going to skip over to verse 19. Go in peace, Elisha said. After Naaman had traveled some distance, Gehazi, the servant of Elisha, the man of God, said to himself, my master was too easy on Naaman, this Aramean, by not accepting from him what he brought. As surely as the Lord lives, I will run after him and get something from him. So Gehazi hurried. Did I click it? So Gehazi hurried after Naaman. When Naaman saw him running toward him, he got down from the chariot to meet him. Is everything all right? He asked. Everything is all right, Gehazi answered. My master sent me to say... Two young men from the company of the prophets have just come to me from the hill country of Ephraim. Please give them a talent of silver, that's 34 kilos of silver, and two sets of clothing. By all means, take two talents, said Naaman. He urged Gehazi to accept them and then tied up the two talents of silver in two bags with two sets of clothing. He gave them to two of his servants and they carried them ahead of Gehazi. When Gehazi came to the hill, he took the things from the servants and put them away in the house. He sent the men away and they left. When he went in and stood before his master, 
sorry, next slide. When he went in and stood before his master, Elisha asked him, where have you been, Gehazi? Your servant didn't go anywhere, Gehazi answered. When I read this, I can't help thinking about this meme. Because <laughs> I'm sure Gehazi would have just been wanting to disappear. I mean, what was he thinking? Trying to lie to someone that God is directly speaking to. But Elisha said to him, Was not my spirit with you when the man got down from his chariot to meet you? Is this the time to take money or to accept clothes or olive groves and vineyards or flocks and herds or male and female slaves? Naaman's leprosy will cling to you and to your descendants forever. Then Gehazi went from Elisha's presence and his skin was leprous. It had become as white as snow. Wow, what a story. A couple of plot twists in that one. As you keep reading, you're like, wasn't expecting that. Well, we're going to examine three of the people that we just read about. And we're going to look at how they made things all about themselves. As we do this, your job is to see which person you relate to the most. Are you ready? You guys are ready. All right, let's go. Yes, a few more yeses. Okay. We're looking at Gehazi. So you're going to look at who you relate to. Gehazi. King of Israel, his name was Jehoram, and Naaman. So are you like Gehazi? Gehazi had heard about or maybe even seen Naaman's healing of leprosy. But he decided that Naaman should have to pay something in return for this healing that he'd received. Part of this thinking may have been because Naaman was from the enemy nation of Aram. You've come to my country. You've come to my house asking for help. And we've helped you. So, you owe me. It's time to pay up. Ghazi might have also been thinking, I've dedicated my whole life to God by being Elisha's servant. So, God, I deserve something for all of my hard work. Whatever the case, Gehazi was making things about himself. Let's look again from verse 19. After Naaman had traveled some distance, Gehazi, the servant of Elisha, the man of God, said to himself, My master was too easy on Naaman, this Aramean, by not accepting from him what he brought. As surely as the Lord lives, I will run after him and get something from him. So Gehazi hurried after Naaman. When Naaman saw him running toward him, he got down from the chariot to meet him. Is everything all right? he asked. Everything is all right, Gehazi answered. My master sent me to say, two young men from the company of the prophets have just come to me from the hill country of Ephraim. Please give them a talent of silver and two sets of clothing. In other words, Gehazi is saying, Naaman, Naaman, you wouldn't believe it, but two men of God have just flown in from overseas and it just so happens they have no cash. And both of their suitcases got lost at the airport. What are the chances? <laughs> <laughs> so Naaman gives him money and he gives him clothes. But of course, God sees that Gehazi is making things all about himself by lying and deceiving just for his own personal gain. Consequently, Elisha says... Naaman's leprosy will cling to you and to your descendants forever. Then Gehazi went from Elisha's presence, and his skin was leprous. It had become as white as snow. When Gehazi made things about himself, things didn't go too well for him, did it? If you look in the book of Acts, in chapter 5, you'll read a recount of a husband and a wife, Ananias and Sapphira, who made things all about themselves, by selling a piece of land, keeping some of the money for themselves, and then giving the rest of the money to the church. But they lied by saying that that was all of the money that they had got from the sale. Now, there's nothing wrong with selling a piece of land. There was nothing wrong with keeping some of the money for themselves. The issue is that they made things all about themselves by lying to make other people think that they were really generous. 
both of them died on the spot. They died just to gain the approval of others. How often do you feel like people owe you because of how you've helped them? How often do you feel like God owes you more money or a new job or healing just because you've been a good person? How often have you gone out of your way to prove to others that you're successful in your career or in your relationships or in your finances? When you make things about yourself, things won't go well for you. Now, I know I've used two pretty extreme examples here. And I'm not saying that when you make things about yourself, you'll drop dead or you'll get leprosy. But I also can't say that that won't happen because I don't know the future and I don't know what God's going to do. But I do know this. When you make things about you, you miss out on God's best for your life. I'll say it again. When you make things about you, you miss out on God's best for your life. Are you like King Jehoram? Let's read about him from verse 4. Naaman went to his master and told him what the girl from Israel had said. By all means, go, the king of Aram replied. I will send a letter to the king of Israel. So Naaman left, taking with him ten talents of silver, six thousand shekels of gold, and ten sets of clothing. The letter that he took to the king of Israel read, With this letter I am sending my servant Naaman to you so that you may cure him of his leprosy. As soon as the king of Israel read the letter, he tore his robes and said, Am I God? Can I kill and bring back to life? Why does this fellow send someone to me to be cured of his leprosy? See how he is trying to pick a quarrel with me. King Jehoram was focusing on his lack of ability and lack of power to heal Naaman. And he was focusing on what someone else might have been thinking about him. How often do you focus on what you're not good at? How often do you focus on what you can't do? And how often do you make stories up in your mind about what other people might be thinking about you? When King Jehoram made things about himself like this, he became fearful and anxious. And if you're feeling fearful or anxious or out of control, maybe you're being like King Jehoram and focusing too much on what you can't do and on what you can't control. Finally, are you like Naaman? Naaman wanted a miracle from God. In fact, it looks like Naaman thought he could buy a miracle from God because that's what all the other religions did at the time. In fact, even still today, that's how a lot of religions work. You give money to the gods, or you say the right incantations, or you pray at the right time of day, or you do the good deeds in order to earn the love and favor of the God, and hopefully that God will notice you and answer your prayers. That's not how it works with the one true God, Jesus Christ, the God of the Bible. If you've given your life to Jesus, if you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, then even if you don't give money, even if you don't say special words, even if you don't pray long prayers, even if you don't do the good deeds, whether you like it or not, Jesus notices you. Jesus accepts you. Jesus loves you, and he wants the very best for you. There's nothing you can do to earn the love of God, because he already loves you. And there's nothing you can do to make him stop loving you, because his love for you is not dependent on anything you've done. His love for you does not depend on how well you perform as a Christian. He loves you simply because he chooses to love you. Don't make it about you. It's all about him. 
So Naaman wants a miracle, but he also wants this miracle to happen the way he expects it to. But Naaman went away angry and said, I thought that he would surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God, wave his hand over the spot and cure me of my leprosy. Are not Abana and Farpar, the rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel? Couldn't I wash in them and be cleansed? So he turned and went off in a rage. So Naaman saying, why is this servant talking to me? I don't want him to talk to me. I want the prophet of God to be talking to me. He should have at least come out of his house to see me. I thought I would just be able to put out my leprosy arm and the prophet would come and do these ones over it and I'd be healed. (laughs) But instead he's telling me to go wash in the mediocre Jordan River. Being a high-ranking and successful commanding officer of the army, Naaman was probably used to being in control. And we see here that he wanted to control the way that God works. Naaman was making his desired healing all about his own expectations instead of what God was doing. His ego and desire for control were blocking him from breakthrough in his health. When Naaman made things about himself, he was missing out on the miracle that God wanted to do in his life. I think it's pretty clear that when you make things about you, You miss out on God's best for your life. Okay, Alex. So I shouldn't make things about me, but what should I do instead? Glad you asked, Carlos. Good question. Very good question. The answer is, don't make it about you. Make it about God. Elisha shows us how to focus on God instead of ourselves. Unlike Gehazi, Elisha didn't go around feeling entitled. In other words, Elisha could have asked people for payment for all of the miracles that God was doing through him. Or Elisha could have had an attitude toward God of, God, you should bless me because I've done so many good things in my life and brought so many people to you, so I deserve it. But instead, even though Naaman urged Elisha to accept his gifts, Elisha declined because he knew that God knows our needs and desires. And he knew that God is our provider and can do immeasurably more than all we can ask or imagine. So don't think that you need to lie or deceive or take more than you should just to get by in life. Live God's way. And God's way, it's it's spelled out in the Bible. Live God's way. Honor him in all that you do. And you can have the same faith that Elisha had, that same unwavering confidence that God will supply your every need and so much more. Unlike Jehoram, the king of Israel, Elisha didn't focus on what he couldn't do. And he didn't focus on what other people might have thought about him. Look, Elisha raised a boy from the dead. Elisha accurately foretold the end of a severe famine. Elisha even caused an entire enemy army to be blinded. But he was fully aware that that was not by his own power. He knew that that was the power of the living God that did those things. And it was because of this knowledge and faith in what God can do that Elisha was able to so confidently say to King Jehoram, Relax, it's okay. My God will sort this out. So the next time you feel inadequate or not strong enough or not smart enough or you're stressing out because you can't control the outcome of the situation, trust in God's power to make a way and in God's power to defeat the giants in your life. Trust in God to do the impossible. Now, with Naaman, he actually ended up making things about God instead of himself. Have a look from verse 13. Naaman's servants went to him and said, My father, if the prophet had told you to do some great thing, would you not have done it? How much more then when he tells you, wash and be cleansed? 
So he went down and dipped himself in the Jordan seven times as the man of God had told him, and his flesh was restored and became clean like that of a young boy. So when Naaman finally stopped making things about himself, when he put aside his pride and expectations, God not only healed Naaman of his leprosy, but he made his skin like that of a young boy. You know how little babies, their skin is so soft and smooth and supple? Good word, isn't it? Supple? I did look it up to make sure I was using the right word. (laughs) Well, that's what Naaman's skin became like. God gave Naaman even more than he asked for. He not only removed the disease, he left Naaman in an even better state than before. This is what happens when you stop making things about yourself and you put your faith and your trust in what God can do. He doesn't just heal the sickness. He doesn't just change the circumstance. He doesn't just change your mindset. He gives you more peace and more joy, and more resilience than you had before. He doesn't just give you freedom from your past, but he gives you purpose for your future. And that's the vision of LifeGate Church, to live in the freedom and purpose that Jesus has for your lives. This is what Jesus does. He frees you from the things that are holding you back, and he releases you to live a life with purpose. He gives you a reason to live. So don't make it about you. Make it about God. Focus on what God can do. Focus on the fact that God is more powerful than the obstacle you're facing. And He's a God who deeply cares about you. And He is a God that can heal you and that can do the impossible in your life. 